Hello, my friends, and welcome to another episode of the Robcast. This is episode 202, and it's called Bird and Lime. Although I don't know, yes, it's an episode, <laughs> but this one, honestly, it's more like an extended riff because I noticed something eh, a month or two ago, and Kristen and I had noticed it as Kristen had noticed it as well, and we had been discussing it. And then yesterday, uh, we were out taking a stroll in the neighborhood. I was with my lady, Kristen Bell, whom you know. And then our friend, Kristen Hangy was in town. So she was with us. We're strolling in our neighborhood, and I launch into this extended riff about this thing that I'd noticed over the past few months. And the riff just goes and goes I mean, we're at the third block, the fourth block, and I'm still talking about it. And then we ended up uh, having lunch at this restaurant where there are like tables on the sidewalk, and I keep going. It's like part two of this riff, and I started laughing, thinking, I should just stop and record this and make this a Robcast episode, and they were like, yeah, you should. <laughs> so normally, these episodes, I've been, they've been in the marinade. I've been stewing on it. I've been chewing on it. I've been carrying it around for a while. Um, but this is this episode is an extended riff that is roughly, let's say, 24, 30 hours old. <laughs> so we'll see where it goes. With that disclaimer in mind and the double affirmation of two Kristens, yeah, you should totally make an episode about that. Here we go. So shout out to Kristen Hange and Kristen Bell for the double yeah, just just record that riff. So what I noticed, this is, uh, I don't know, two months ago, let's say, maybe more, right around there, is this place where I surf, there's a boardwalk where you can um, run, walk, ride a bike, rent a bike along the ocean. And I park, and then when I leave my car, I have to cross this little cement sort of boardwalk in order to get to the sand, in order to get to the water. And a while ago, I noticed these a couple of these black scooters. Um, picture like a strip, like an adult scooter that had been stripped down of everything superfluous. So a black scooter, and it had like a little thing on the top that looked like a sensor, and I was like, oh, interesting. And then on the side of the head tube, in uh, there's like a white logo that just said bird. And I noticed people would just walk up to one of these scooters, get on it, like push a button or something and off they'd go. And I was like, oh, it's like ride share. It's, it's like a, a communal thing. I noticed them, and then I began over the next couple of weeks to notice them in more and more places around where I surf. Somebody was leaving these black scooters that had the word bird on them, and then you could just get it. And I was like, oh, there's obviously an app of some sort. And it's clearly electric. Somebody has charged it up because when one would go by, it wouldn't make any noise. And I also noticed how fast they were. And then one time I, I walked right by one and noticed it said, first ride is a dollar. And I was like, oh, somebody started a company where they made this like stripped down all black scooter that's already got its charge. It's, real, it's, it's faster than you think it would be. And they just leave them out. And I guess you go on the app and you just check in, whatever it is, and you get charged for how long you use it. And then when you're done with it, you just leave it. A bit like a bike share thing, only scooter. And then over the next couple of weeks, I noticed more and more and more of them. And in the morning, I would notice they'd be grouped together. And then when I noticed them later in the day, they'd be spread out. And then I came across an article on the internet about this company that said that those are called nests and that there's a whole world of... And then I'd seen a pickup truck filled with these scooters. And I was like, oh. And then and then the article explained there's this whole group of people who work for this company, Bird, and they go around at the end of the day, collect the scooters that are scattered all over town, and charge them, do minor repairs, and then put them out in groups in the morning, which are called nests, as in a bird nest. So I'm sort of observing this thing and thinking, how interesting. Because all of those elements have already existed. We've had apps now for a little while. 
We've had electricity and battery batteries that can charge for a while. We've had scooters for years. Like we've had all of these different elements, but somebody took all these different elements and connected and assembled them and made something that we haven't seen before. Like a communal property scooter that if you need to go somewhere, you just get on one and take it. And then when you're done with it, you just leave it and somebody else sorts out the collection of it and the maintenance of it and all of that. Yeah, you know, in information architecture, which is like a whole world of study, uh, there is an adage that the assembling of old information creates new information. You take things that have already existed and you simply assemble them, and that, in fact, you take the old and you assemble enough old together, you get something new. By the way, this reminds me, uh, a number of years ago, I wrote this book called Love Wins, and in the introduction of the book, I said, I just want to make it really clear, I'm not saying anything new in this book. Anybody who finds this content new, I'm just sharing with you how th people have seen things for literally thousands of years. There's nothing, did a whole, like, there's nothing new in this book. But a friend of mine, Dan Klein, shout out to Dan Klein, who's actually one of the sort of global leaders in information architecture, sent me this email. And I just went and looked it up because it's from like March of 2011, where he basically was like, hey, uh, I like the book, but your intro, mm-mm, uh, no, you're insisting that there's nothing new, he says, but you've assembled together a number of things and the way it's said and the way it's attached, it's almost like he said, the kind of duct tape you used, <laughs> do you know what I mean? He basically said, you shouldn't say there's nothing new here because the assembling, and then he led me into this information architecture understanding that when you attach together and assemble together a number of things that may have already existed, you have in fact done something new. Isn't that interesting? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm struck with the number of people I meet who are under the illusion that to do good work in the world, you have to invented something new, or it has to be entirely original. But the fact of the matter is, you may simply be assembling a number of different elements that have already existed. It's just nobody ever thought to, to assemble those elements or to assemble them that way. Yes, yes, somebody may have said that before, but you made it more accessible. Yes, somebody, somebody may have sent that message out into the world, but you haven't. And there is something about it coming through you that will fundamentally give it its own feel and flavor and angle and slant. So for every one of you who's under some like, well, I, I, you know, I'd love to do something, but it's all been done before. No, no, it hasn't. It hasn't all been done before. And the people who are really thriving, doing interesting work, you'll notice they never have the sense of, oh, everybody's done it. They have the sense of, well, we'll attach to this to this. We'll reclaim this. This has been buried in a heap of history. We need to uncover it. And, and that alone is original enough. So somebody had this idea, let's make like an indestructible scooter that scaled for an adult, because you've only mostly seen a scooter the so like a kid size. Let's make a scooter for an adult. Let's make it pretty ripping fast. Um, let's attach it to an app, and then let's just put them out there. By the way, Kristen and I were renting bicycles a couple of months ago, and bicycles, <laughs> yeah, in 1814, bicycle. We were renting bikes, and... Uh, I had to fill out all these forms, and then we had to sign, and then I had to sign this form, and then I had to sign that form, and then they took the credit card, and then the person running it had to check with this person. Then they sent us over to this person who was gonna get us the bikes. Kristen and I were like, this is taking forever. This feels, and there were like literal clipboards with like pens, which, you know, I love pen and paper, but it was interesting that Kristen and I were commenting, this feels so analog and slow and bulky, and then they make you leave your driver's license with them, which how many of you have had that experience before, where they're like, yes, you can, just leave your driver's license, and you're just leaving it with some guy named Jimmy 
who, right? You know what I'm talking about? You're like, this doesn't feel right. And it's like a metal con like shipping container that's rusting. And he's got nine bikes in there. And you're like, yeah, sure. Have my driver's license, no problem. Uh, but w it's funny that we were discussing when we rented these bikes a little while ago, somebody's going to come along and make this way easier. And so you do already have this with bikes, but it's like somebody took, you have this like city bikes where you just walk up and there's an app, but somebody took that and then they said, let's make it even simpler than a bike. And let's make it something you, you so unbelievably accessible. And they assembled all these different pieces into this scooter named Bird. And I swear to you, over the past few months, at first I felt like I saw like three, and then I saw 10, and then I saw 20, and then I saw 30. And then you just start seeing people everywhere in them. Which, by the way, it raises all sorts of questions, doesn't it? Because the premise is a nest of scooters gets put out in all these different places around town. Uh, it, it raises questions. Can you start a business with a physical object and then just place it in public spaces? Like, can you, do, can you just do that and just put it wherever you want? Can I come up with a business in which I make money by placing things in the center of your town, like our sidewalks, because if you're going to sell like fruit on the sidewalk or like at the Santa Monica Promenade, if you're going to perform, you have to go get a permit. But is there an electric scooter permit? Because as far as I know, this is a category that haven't, that hasn't existed yet. So these scooters raise interesting questions about the nature of public space as it relates to economics and profit. Is all public space wide open and you can just come up with something and set up your proverbial tent or does there have to be some regulating of some sort? Because we do that in all sorts of other areas. You can't just set up and start selling things. You can't just set up and start whatever it is. So what this scooter thing does is it raises all sorts of questions about the nature of public space and then the other day, I saw this couple, an adult couple, who had fit, the two of them clearly have something special going on between them because the two of them have fit on one of these bird scooters and they were like, their bodies were like melded together and they were hauling down the street. They were moving. Can you get on an electric scooter with another person and just maneuver through traffic like you're a car. <laughs> and what's funny about that question to me is we've never had that question really before. It's like a whole new question. Uh, it's not only issues of space that this new phenomenon raises, it raises issue of safety. Is that fine? Is it not fine? And it raises another question, which is who decides? Who, who decides... Uh, where where you can do this, where you can. And then <laughs> I just took my dog for a walk and took my daughter to her friend's house and then was going to come back inside and record this episode. And when I walked out front, what do you think was on the sidewalk in front of my house? Is that poetry or what? A bird scooter. Somebody, in the hour before I was going to do this episode about this new phenomenon of electric scooters, somebody was riding one and apparently was done with it. Because that's the thing, is when you're done, you just leave it. They'll, they'll find it, I guess, later. The nest people, whoever they are. Somebody just got done in front of my house and just walked away from them. They have little kickstands. So there's one like out in front of my house right now. How good is that? Or parentheses, annoying is that. Can you just leave your stuff all out in front of my house or your house? Like, can I invent something and then just leave it in front of your house? Is that fine? Who decides? Now, the question of who decides or how does it get regulated, that is, uh, what was the word for that? Think about it with me. What would you call this decision? Because 
somebody somewhere who thinks about public space, who thinks about safety, who thinks about economics and commerce in the public sphere. Somebody will have to figure out what's proper and what's not exactly how it's happened with Uber and Lyft and all the ride sharing things. Um, what's acceptable, what's not, how are we going to arrange this? There were airports I would fly into a couple of years ago that wouldn't even allow Uber to pick you up at the airport. And now every airport you fly into has a designated ride share area where you get picked up. So we went from something that didn't exist, Uber, Lyft, to something that only certain places allowed to now something that everything allows and it has its own sign and organization. So somebody had to sort that out. You know what the word for that is? The word for that is political. Because the word politikos comes from the Greek word, uh, means citizen. And so the citizens are constantly in the process of arranging our shared life together. How do we think about agriculture? How do we think about economics? How do we think about transportation? How do we think about education? How do we order ourselves and arrange ourselves for our common good together? Yeah, the word, the word is political. So this scooter, this fascinating new scooter phenomenon, and where you can, I assume at some point, somebody, because if I already have one in front of my house, and I'm about as like, whatever, no problem as it gets, but you know there's somebody somewhere who's going to end up with a nest in front of their house and be like, not in my front yard, <laughs> right? Not on the sidewalk. You know at some point they're going to be like, they're going to start raising questions. It's just a matter of time before somebody's like, no, you can't be in traffic. Okay, so you can't have to be on sidewalks. And somebody's going to be like, you can't be on sidewalks because you almost hit my kid. Somebody... You realize this is gonna, someone's gonna have to figure out how this organizes, and that, my friends, would be political. Now, the moment I use that word, for many people, political is like, no, that's a whole other thing. And I would say, no, the word political is a good word. It's how we arrange our shared life together. And what's interesting about our political life together is we're constantly, we have new problems, new technologies, new inventions, new stresses, new opportunities. There are new resources. There's the, um, the lessening. Certain resources become more scarce. So we're constantly together having to figure this thing out. And we live in a particular society where we appoint people who are hopefully level-headed and kind and humble and smart and informed and they get together. So I'm assuming somebody somewhere in what? The city office, transportation office, public parks and rec, uh, streets, traffic, somebody somewhere we've appointed, elected, hired um, to do this sort of thing. And so when you see something like this, you're not just seeing, oh, what a cool new invention that seems to be catching on like wildfire here in this particular city. You're seeing another challenge and opportunity for how we arrange our shared life together. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and then, and then just the other day, uh, right near where I surf, there's a canal that dumps water into the ocean. And Kristen and I were walking over the canal and we looked down and it probably had two feet of water in it. And we looked over the edge and there in the canal, half in the water, half sticking out was one of those bird scooters. And it had like some grime, you know, like that nasty water that's been standing a little bit. Um, it had like canal water all over it and you're like, ah, oh, I just saw the first one of these, you know, a month, two months ago, and now somebody took one and tossed it off this little bridge into the canal. <laughs> and it's funny because when I saw that scooter there in the canal, sort of half submerged, I thought about whoever owns this company and whoever was like, we're going to revolutionize urban transportation. We're going to do something 
that helps people get from point A to point B in the easiest fashion. It's going to be easy on the environment. We're going to create new opportunities and new jobs. It's going to be good for tourism because you can make your way easy around a new city. It's going to be good for commuting, getting people to work. It's going to be, you know, somebody had this idea and they they like, saw, wait, we'll use all this app stuff. We'll use all what we now know about battery life. We'll give it like a, a scale and durability. Like somebody pulled together all this and had this idea and they must have, I assume, found investors. Like somebody was on it. And I was thinking like, what if the owner found themselves with me walking over that bridge and saw that bird scooter <laughs> floating submerged there in the canal? Like, oh, the dream is dead, I would say to them. And I thought, I, I pictured myself, I pictured them and I pictured uh, what you would say to them if they saw that, because that image, and I and I had this thought like, you know you're you know you're doing something when you when they tossed your scooter in the canal. <laughs> There's a mantra for you, yeah yeah that's all part of it. That's all part of it. Every one of you who've ever received some criticism, every one of you who've ever had your work disregarded. Um, everybody who's ever been disrespected, uh, everybody who's ever had a hater, you know what I'm talking about. It's like you aren't doing something until you have your first scooter tossed in the canal. It's like now you're in the game. Yeah, now you're in the game. Yeah, I was, I was uh, meeting with somebody recently who just got their first criticism. And uh, so we had to do Criticism 101 because um, they were like, oh my word, should I even go on? They're sort of catatonic. And it was like, and I'm just like, welcome, welcome. Yeah, now you're in the game. Yeah, whatever you were doing before, apparently uh, whatever you were doing never crossed over into any other new spheres or territories. It safely existed within a world where it was fully understood, fully accepted, and fully valued. But whatever you're doing, apparently it moved beyond those narrow boundaries. Apparently it grew. Apparently those couldn't contain and it spilled over. And in its, what is that, largeness, expansion, it drifted over into areas where it wasn't understood, it wasn't appreciated. Somebody had contrary information, however that works. Yeah, so it was funny because they were sort of, oh, what do I do? Should I even be doing this? And I was like, oh, uh, wait, the, yeah, no, now you're, now you're doing something. Welcome to phase two or phase three. <laughs> the student has become the master. <laughs> Yeah, how's that, by the way, for a mantra? Yeah, I like that. Something, I know that one of you will do a tattoo on that. Something like, uh, you're just a rookie until someone throws a scooter in the channel. Now you're in business. <laughs> now you're in business. By the way, you'd also say, what, you're going to put thousands of scooters out onto the streets? Of course someone's going to throw it into the canal. What were you expecting? Yeah, every one of you who's trying to do something new, the fundamental nature of doing something new is it contains implicit critique within it. And this is often the thing that surprises people. It shocks them because they didn't see the coming because they're like, I'm just doing my thing here. What's the problem? Why do these people, why am I getting this pushback? Here's why. Because when you do your thing, see, there is explicit critique, which is when you do something and you say, that thing sucks. The old way is irrelevant. The ways that everybody else is doing it are completely ineffective and irrelevant. I'm gonna do it this, there's like an explicit critique, which is that's terrible, I'm gonna do it a new way. But then there's implicit critique, which is simply you doing it this way and not how it's always been done brings with it an implicit critique. You clearly know how everybody does it and yet you're doing it this way. And that carries with it critique even if you never externally ever even acknowledge there was some other way to do it. You'll see this in family systems when the, whatever, the fifth kid or the third cousin or whoever it is, the first daughter, they simply do things in a way that's different than how the family does them. And they're doing it that way because that's the path of life. That's where it's headed. That's where the lamp is shining. That's clearly the next step in the path. And yet the family is just, just out of their minds. Like, what are you doing? They're like, what are you talking about? What? I'm just. It's because of implicit critique. You doing it that way is saying something 
about the dominant consciousness. You not attending that thing, you not signing up for that, you not putting your kids through that thing, whatever it is. It happens in business, it happens in family, it happens in religion, good God. For many people, they're like, why am I getting all this feedback? Because your very actions, without you saying a word, you can have the purest heart in the universe, but you doing it this way is a deep critique of that way, even if you never acknowledge that way even exists. Yeah, yeah, that's how it is. That's how it is. You do something and who knows what might come your way and who knows who may toss one of your scooters into the canal. I was thinking about the owner when they were like doing budgets and I assume there's like a giant line item for damaged scooters. Cause you know, you give the public access to something with wheels, <laughs> You could only imagine what people are going to bang into and crash into and ways people are going to find to abuse these things, which is why they appear to be built like somewhat indestructible. But you know that it was like, was one of the accountants ever just like, by the way, we should make a line item for, uh, what should we do? What, 10 a month? What, 100 a year are going to get thrown in a canal and someone's like, no one's ever going to throw this in a canal. You just watch. People are very creative. <laughs> so... I notice these things more and more and more. They're everywhere. Literally yesterday, Kristen and I were walking along telling Kristen, our, our friend Kristen, who's in town, about these scooters when two people went by on them. Like they're, it's like they're now, it's like one of those things where like at first you see a couple and then once you see them, now you see them everywhere. But then here's the thing that happened this week. This just blew my mind. I get out to, uh, I, I get out to surf, I'm walking across that boardwalk to um, where, where normally there are a bunch of the scooters around and there are a whole group, should I say, I guess I don't say nest in this situation, interesting enough, caught myself, there's a whole group of white scooters and the white scooters don't say bird on them, the white scooters say lime and have a little uh, logo of a, like a cross section of a lime, like the fruit. And they're white with green letters and they say lime and they look a lot like bird scooters. And I was like, oh, competition. Oh, now there's bird, but then there's also lime. And then I got out there and saw people were going up and down the boardwalk on lime scooters. This was a couple of days ago. And I was like, Oh, interesting. Yeah, there's like somebody else had this same idea. And then, <laughs> you ready for this? A, a couple of days ago, there were a whole bunch of bird scooters in our neighborhood, and then there were also a whole bunch of lime scooters. And then this morning, like right after sunrise, I'm going down the street, and on one side of the street at every intersection is a group of bird scooters, and on the other side of the street is a whole group of lime scooters. They're literally, it's like an arms race of electrically charged scooters all over particular areas of Los Angeles, and they're literally setting up in the morning at the same intersections just on opposing sides of the street. How great. Please tell me somebody is documenting this because it's the great scooter wars of 2018. Who will win? By the way, if you're the owner of scooter or you're an investor in, uh, of, uh, sorry, bird, if you're the owner or an investor or employee, employee of bird, are you upset about Lyme or are you happy about Lyme? Right. How did you answer that question? What was your first gut thing? Where you're like, oh, is this like Stone Temple Pilots and Pearl Jam? Oh, they sound just like us, but came out. Which one is that? Do you like that reference? Early 90s music reference? Are you upset? Like, ah, somebody stole our idea. Or are you encouraged? Now, let me give you just a, a quick bit of data. What they've noticed is that when there's a McDonald's on a street, and at like an intersection, if there's a McDonald's, if they open a Burger King across the intersection from a McDonald's, sales go up in the McDonald's. Yes, it's counterintuitive, correct? Because you'd be like, wait, if you open a Burger King across the street from McDonald's, 
then that's going to take sales away from McDonald's. No. What, we, what they've seen over the years is that that increases the sales in the original McDonald's. Why is that? Because prior to that, there's just one restaurant at that intersection. That's your option. But now that you have two restaurants, that intersection, it's now a, it's, it's a different category. It's not just a restaurant. That intersection becomes a place where there are food options. So in the psyche, there's now a far larger game those two restaurants are playing that you can't play if it's just you. It's like you moved up a division. You move from just a restaurant to a category. You are now, would you rather dominate as the only offering or would you rather be a major player in a larger category? And, and there's obviously, you can go back and forth on all this, but what's fascinating is this electric scooter thing, at least where we live here, is now a thing. It's now a whole category. It's not just this little weird company that makes all black scooters called Bird. It's now a category of, have you seen those chargeable scooters? Yeah. See, it raises these questions about the, the nature of how things work. And notice the sign doesn't say at the airport Uber, and it doesn't say Lyft. It says ride sharing. It's now an entirely new expanding category. By the way, who knew that this would catch on? I mean, like this morning, every intersection for a long stretch of a very busy road near my house and then when I got off the freeway, at the, when I got right next to the ocean, I swear to you, every intersection had scooters. I mean, like I must have passed hundreds and hundreds of scooters early this morning. Who knew that would catch on? Remember a number of years ago, early 2000s, when there was that announcement that a new invention was coming that was going to change everything? I think it was called the It or something. And there was going to be this unveiling on television, and it was going to change the way that the modern world is organized. And then when it was revealed, it was called the Segway. Remember that? And it had like a it was like a platform with wheels with a stick that had some sort of gyroscope feature so that you didn't fall over. And it was like this: people are going to abandon their cars, your cities, neighborhoods, transportation. People are going to be doing this. They're going to be out in the fresh air. They're going to be around. And remember, was it President George Bush who? There was that video of him falling, uh, crashing on one, which wasn't the best look for anybody involved. Uh, but now if I said to you, you know, segways, you would say to me, like, mall cops? Is that what you're talking about? Those things that they ride? Or tourists who are in downtown areas who have to wear large, awkward helmets when they're on them, right? That was supposed to change the game. Everybody was supposed to do those. And it didn't really catch on as a mass thing. But now you have a far more simple, and yet through the internet, uh, sophisticated thing, which turned out to be just like a scooter, which everybody rode as a kid, right? With a couple of technological advancements. So there was this like this segue, this incredibly advanced thing, which was like, this is the future. But now, at least over the past couple of months, apparently the future Future is a little more punk rock. It's a little more stripped down. By the way, right before I recorded this episode, I went to the Lime website to even make sure that it was Lime, that I had the word right. And uh, you know what word they use on their homepage? Movement. <laughs> movement. Join the Lime movement. Who knew? Who knew that would catch on? like it has. Once again, uh, like I'm always fascinated with even the experts don't know what's going to catch. But man, there are now thousands of them all around where I live. So if you haven't seen this yet, um, then, then, I, then welcome, because I'm betting it's coming your way. And if it fades out and fizzles out here, well, then this episode, you know, just became the extended riff that it always was. <laughs> and that's the thing. You laugh at it. We laugh at it. But it might become massive. Uh, it might be a fad or it might be the future. 
And no one really knows. And the interesting thing is you have to be careful that you don't ridicule something that then everybody catches on and it works and people start using it. Like one word, Twitter, right? Twitter. And when you're on Twitter, the thing that you do on Twitter is you tweet. If I had told you there's going to be this thing that millions of people are going to do, including the president, we're going to hear about massive changes in American foreign policy via this particular platform. You're like, oh, really? What's it called? What's it called? International Broadcast Symposium? Nah, nah, nah. What's it called? What's it called? Significant Content Dissemination Services? Nah, nah. What's it going to be called? Uh, it's going to be called Twitter. Twitter, yep. And what are you going to do on it? You're going to tweet, right? You would probably have been like, that's not going to work. That's not going to catch on. And the president's not going to do that, at least not in public with people knowing, right? And yet, that is what we have, this odd world we find ourselves in. So when the interesting thing about something like this is you see it and you see it catch on, and you, you, it's like you have to pause and be careful. You don't laugh too hard. Adults riding scooters. It still seems to me completely absurd. And yet, you got to be really careful because... Uh, you might find yourself on one at some point. You know what I mean? This might become really massive. This actually, and there's some of this on the Lime site, this might actually solve some problems. I mean, this could have something to do with the environment and traffic, and who knows what causes, uh, what problems, what inefficiencies might be resolved through the acclimation of a uh, adult scaled electric scooter that sort of exists out in public spaces. It could be a fad, like those hoverboards that dudes were on that were like, are you serious? It might just come and go. Every kid might ask for one for Christmas for only one year, or in the future, that just might be how people get around. And there might be a, there might be a scooter lane <laughs> on the road. You don't... It could be a fad or it could be the future. You can laugh, but it might uh, be massive. Isn't that interesting? All of this in these funny scooters flying around. So uh, we're on the stro we're strolling in the neighborhood, and I'm on my extended riff as literally lime and bird scooters are going by, and Kristen. Um, our friend Kristen had never seen any of them, and Kristen and I are telling her, like, check, watch this, see them? There, there's one, there, now there's a lime one, and uh, we end up having lunch at this uh, restaurant on the side, where the tables are on the sidewalk. It's the best falafel and hummus in LA. And by the way, I'm not actually exaggerating, it was actually voted best uh, falafel and hummus in LA, and this uh, restaurant in our neighborhood, and we're sitting out on a Saturday afternoon, and... Um, Saturday afternoons in the neighborhood are like, it's like a sneakerhead central. So there are people, there are all these shops. Um, there's like restaurants and there are all these shops that sell like killer tennis shoes. So there's people, um, sneakerheads coming and going. And then you have, um, somebody had set up a station on the sidewalk and they were cutting hair. So just a couple like doors down from where we're eating, people are getting outdoor haircuts. And then as opposed to indoor haircuts, I guess they're getting haircuts outdoors. <laughs> And then um, there's a dog rescue place where we got our dog and there are people coming and going from there with their dogs that they've just adopted to take home. And we're out on the sidewalk and there's kids and families and music because a number of the stores like pump music out. And then uh, it's just like, it's just, it's just the best. And we're describing these scooters and the scooters are going by us and we're laughing because there's a there's bird on one side and lime on the other. And of course, I'm like, my riff is in full gear at this point. Uh, but all of it, all of it, all the way to the fact that somebody was like, let's do scooters. You know, like you have a friend, like that brilliant tech friend. You're like, hey, what, what's your next big idea? And they're like, scooters for adults. <laughs> You're like, really? Yep, it's going to be the future. And you're laughing until you realize, I read one article that wondered if this was a billion-dollar industry already. <laughs> what is it about the human insatiable need to create? Why 
do we have this unquenchable desire to move things forward? I know this is an absurd episode about scooters, and yet it is a flesh and blood embodiment of a deeper human impulse. We can't help but create. We can't help but cook up new ways to move things forward, to tweak things, to make them more efficient, to make them more fun. And it's not just scooters. Uh, part of it is I love sort of scooters because it feels slightly absurd, and yet medicine, politics, policies, justice, equality, uh, better immigration policies, better ways to educate people. Think of all the thousands and thousands of people who every day wake up and give their energies to moving the whole thing forward, to making better art, to telling better stories, to getting us healthier, to figuring out how we learn and how we can learn better and figuring out how to better care for the planet. Like thousands and thousands of millions of people get up each day and given a blank slate of what they could do, they give themselves to moving things forward. Yeah, and sitting out on the sidewalk, chatting with the two Christians, uh, and somebody's getting their goatee trimmed, and somebody's taking a dog that had been abused and bringing it home. And somebody, there's a new colorway on the R1 NMDs, greatest tennis shoes ever. And somebody's walking out of the store with a new pair of shoes, and I'm eating some of the best hummus and best falafel I've ever had. And, and it's all part of a larger human experience of making things and creating things and experiencing things and assembling elements that were previously present, but no one had thought to arrange them like that. What do you call that? That need, that desire, that impulse, that inclination, that response to life, that yes that you see all around you for those who have eyes to see. What do you call that? I find arguments about whether God exists is so boring. The moment someone's like, oh, they're an atheist, they're a believer, honestly, I'm already bored because I. it's already, to me, it's not the discussion. It's, it's just not a discussion that gets you anywhere. Oh, and that person, they proved, no, they didn't. Just stop it. <laughs> you know what I mean? They proved the infinite. They did, the numinous, the ineffable. Yeah, they really showed them they were wrong. Now, yeah, right, but no one's heart got touched. You know what I'm saying? I find the whole God... Is there a God? Do you believe in God? Uh, to me, it's a boring argument, but a thrilling question. Yeah. What do you call this? And why does it never go away? This sense, and obviously the ancients, like you think about the book of Genesis, the poet right away says, we reflect the divine. He says, we bear the image of the divine. There is something infinitely creative that is inextricably woven into our very being. We can't, can't help but give ourselves to making, creating, giving, loving, embracing, moving the whole thing forward. I thought, why do we keep making more? Why does the whole thing we know from quantum physics, we know from cosmology, we know from astronomy, we know that the universe keeps expanding. It just keeps making more. And yet we reflect that and we know it deep in our bones. Your moments of greatest joy, peace, love, connection, all involve some sort of yes to the next thing. Yes to more. Yes to another step. Yes to this extraordinary gift. So yeah, they're just scooters and they're apparently battery charged and people do it for tourism or just to get around or commuting, however. Yeah, it's just a scooter, but it's also, because of course everything is spiritual, it's also one more 
of the millions of examples of human beings going, hey, let's do something with this. Let's try this. Let's go here. Let's see if that works. Let's make something new. Let's try and solve that problem. Let's stand up for those people. Let's protest that because it isn't a yes to life in all its fullness. So we're going to protest it. Let's sign that petition. Let's boycott that. Let's encourage them. Let's teach them to read. Let's record another episode, shall we? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so to all those scooter people, yeah, yes, of course. And to everybody everywhere who gets up with some sense of, let's move this whole thing forward. Yeah, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that, man, that's, now that's real. That's real. So, my friends, that's bird and lime. And if I see you out on one of those scooters, just give a wave, and I'll, I'll we'll share a moment. <laughs> I have yet to be on one, um, but maybe I'll have to break down at some point just to say that I did it. I don't know. But for you, my friends, grace and peace be with you. <laughs>